And I want to give just a, a slight review to kind of remind everybody what we were talking about a couple, two or three weeks ago. Uh, I appreciate uh, Marty uh, having uh, David Jeremiah come and speak for us. I figured I might get fired if y'all keep uh, having that pastor uh, preach for us. And so that could be a real problem there. And James was telling me how good it really was, and I got a little worried there. So I just want you to know. So, But two or three weeks ago, we started. It's a little series in Psalms. We're not going to go through all 150 chapters of this book it's really a hymn on each chapter is a song so it's not right to say chapters but it is interesting on the divisions in that psalm and as we finish with this we're going to be looking at psalm 22 next week or two weeks from now uh, next week we do have our missionary that's going to be uh, going to south korea she's already been there the last few years and uh, she's looking for support, and I'm praying that we might be a blessing to her, and so I'm really anxious to hear her testimony. However, we will stay in the Psalms for a while, and hopefully these expressions that the Jewish people used of worship will grab hold of us. And the thing that you will notice right off the bat is not all the songs are cheery, uplifting. There are some that have a very real and stark contrast to the way that modern Christianity wants to be. And I think that's a problem. We need to, especially as Christian leaders, be able to tell people what is real. God doesn't hold back. Rahab is in the lineage of Christ. Ruth is in the lineage of Christ. But we still know them as idolaters and adulterers. Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabitess. And we are who we are in this life. And I know our tendency is to, to kind of whitewash things. God doesn't do that. We're forgiven if you know him. Your sins are as far as way the east is from the west. But... What has happened to us in our past, now listen to me, makes us. And even though God has forgotten our sins, we know what we are capable of. And so the songs will sing to that. And they will sing to, Psalm 1, as we were in a few weeks ago, was extremely amazing. But we saw the contrast between the, the godly and the, and the ungodly. The godly were so blessed. This psalm is messianic. Psalm 2, it is about Jesus, but it's also about the state of how we really are as fa fallen, fallen uh, uh, beings. And Oscar read the scripture, so we'll not take time and, and go through the verses one more time, but it's a blessing to us, and it's one that I have uh, rehearsed and rehearsed. But I do want to just give you what I think is the key of the psalm, and as we ended two weeks ago was... That this is a, as much as it is about Jesus, it is a, a prophecy that is missional. It is something that we should be doing ourselves. And in verse 8, I believe it's the key, ask of me. And the old King James says, and I will give you the what? The heathen. And we immediately know what that means. They're not Christian. But the actual word here is the people groups of the world. Ask of me. And, and Jesus, in the final days, will have his elect all collected into the kingdom on earth, an earth made new, not heaven now, the kingdom that's been promised to Abraham and to Israel. But he will also have us included that. We are part of the elect, and it will come from all the nations. I believe as Christians, we can ask God for all the peoples of the world that they might come to Jesus Christ. Even though you may not know their language, even though you may not eat their food, even though you may not be familiar with their culture, get, get this, you can have the common denominator that we are all from Adam and that we're all fallen sinners. And we can have that chance. And let's be honest, if anything, yes, we've seen our country, and we spent a lot of time on this, lost. 
But one thing that is good is America has become more of a melting pot than ever before, and the nations have come to us. Whether it be legal, illegal, I don't care. Don't get into the politics of that. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Amen. My home is somewhere beyond the blue. Susan, that's my quoting of poetry for you, okay? <laughs> I just want you to know that. But we can be missionaries in these dark times. And I want you to know that we saw this here, that's the, the key, and we really only got to the first point, the only true king, Psalm 2, 1 to 12, the hum and these are breaking down the, 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 the responses here. Humanity's purpose, it's full of sin, and we see that. Heaven's purpose, Heaven speaks because of that purpose, and then humanity is subjugated. And that's in verses 10 to 12, and that's how this hymn is really broken out. We only got through humanity's purpose, and just as a way of a little bit of review, just so you'll get it just in a minute, we, we need to feel, and I said this quite starkly, that the loss of America and what we've seen really ties into verse 2 and verse 3 when it says we are rebelling against God and we are bursting the bands asunder. What that means is the bonds of the promise of what started as a foundation. Now, in, in the Hebrew hymnal, they meant it as Israel, right? But in the starting of our country, we could say the same. We had, not everyone was Christian, but we had at least deists in the founding of our country. And you could, you could make the case that Thomas Jefferson and, and Benjamin Franklin were Christian, but they had godly uh, values. They wanted to see society there. And we're seeing all that gone and just wiped away now. And I know it troubles us. But what it really is, is the rebellion, much like Israel had, where the bond that they had with God, the bursting of the bands asunder, and we're now angry and we're going to take God on. And you tell me that's not the country we live in now. I believe it is, isn't it? We get frustrated with that. Listen, the ballot box is not going to change that. The fall election is not going to change that. My goodness, they've got people putting 2016 candidates up and saying, in this name's candidate, we trust. And that is a, a blatant blasphemy of scripture. And we see this, it doesn't matter if you're left or right, we are seeing a change that has happened to where common decency and the expression of, of true statesmanship, stateswomanship, is gone. And, and I, I did, we saw the, the cab driver in New York City getting beat to death today. And the kids videotaping it and they killed him. Now, excuse me, not today, on, on Friday. It broke my heart. And, and they were laughing about it. And this was a man from Northern Africa who had brought his family over. And these teenagers, two girls and two boys, just stomping him to death on the streets. Don't think that our nation is not reaping what it has sown. Mm -hmm. and, and we know this. And, and we've seen this going on for the years. No nation can survive what we have sown. It's not that will it come back and we're praying for revival. There's a line of demarcation for a people. Now, within a nation, there can be a remnant. That's why it says that all the nations will come to them. I believe that every nation, every people group, every tribe will have representatives that will be followers of Jesus Christ. But as a country, you go to a point to where you've gone too far. I, and and I, I see this all the time. I, I, I want a country like I remember that had values and respect and common decency. But it's gone. I, I'll tell you how it gets its own here. And it, where I work at, you know, most of you know I work with seniors. But it can be in the churches too. I'll hear them complain about this loss because they remember what it was like when they went to bed without having to lock their doors. Y'all know what I'm talking about? But they'll get upset about that and they'll blame the younger generation. And the younger generation, of course, blames the older generation, don't they? 
I tend to lean that way and in that direction with them because here's our problem. I go, I agree with them. So, and then I'll say, you, you, you should, you want Christian values back and stated, right? Now y'all look up here with me because I'm not even going to the notes here. I'm a little off script. Okay. As you know, I tend to be, but they'll look at me and they'll say, yes, of course I want Christian values. I go, great. I'll see you in church Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Well, um, uh, you know, Pastor, I, I don't want to go out and get out. And I, I'm sorry. I, I, I have my, my church on TV. I, you know how many times I've heard that in the last two years for COVID? But the same group of people, and I'm talking many, they don't mind meeting at HEB for church. They're getting their groceries, aren't they? Y'all hearing me? Now, we have to set the example, and we should be diligent in this. But the line of demarcation, and that is for the elect safe and elect safe and the remnant. You're going to hear me change my preaching over the next few months to where we're not praying for national revival. We're praying for revival for God's people. Revival for God's people is the key. Revival, you can't revive a dead person. It's dead. It's got to be made new and made alive and born again. Y'all hearing me? Can I get a witness? Oh, and until we get revived, there is not going to be that. And I know that there's been this fear of us falling into socialism and communism. Let me tell you, that's not our problem. That is not our problem. Socialist or communist. It doesn't matter. The country has gone way past that. We are in, in immoralityist. We are way past any form of decency. Some of those, we're headed for a dictatorship, and you know that the spirit of Antichrist is already, already here. Now, don't turn there. I want you guys just to, to see this here. Romans chapter 1 really bears this out as Paul writes to that great city that was controlling the empire, really great, tremendous control over Israel. But verse 21, it says, For although they knew God, this is speaking about mankind now. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, claiming to be wise. You tell me that's not what's happening today. They became what? What's it say there? That's right. And then verse and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God to images resembling mortal man. We surely worship self. Birds and animals, and we, we all want to see that power of the animal kingdom, and they grasp to that, and then people would say, well, that's the totem poles and idol worship, and I understand that, but there is that going back to nature that's almost worshiped now, and then though in verse 24 it says, God gave them up, therefore God gave them up. The old King James will literally call this anathema, it will call this to literally a point of, of no return. To the lust of their hearts, to the impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God. Here, the truth about God, they traded it in for a lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. But notice verse 26, for this reason, he mentions it again, God gave them up. Okay. That's the, the term there that's put that you, you've gone past this as a people to dishonorable passions for their women exchange the natural relationships for those that are contrary to nature. And then it says, and men likewise gave up the natural relationships with women. And there are people that will argue these passages to death. It is as true as is true. What we saw 50 years ago, we are now reaping today. And we're consumed with their passions. God began to give up on us for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving to themselves the due penalty of, of their, their error. And you know, I, I preached on this about two months ago. That's not why I mention this. It's just in the context of what we're talking about. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. That's three times that we've seen this term. What's the word in the old King James, by the way? But it says God gives them up. He what? Go ahead. Reprobate 
Right, Reprobates. Y'all yeah, okay. know what I'm saying. <laughs> God gives up. All this stuff about God not letting go and all this. No. There is a group that has taken the country and taken the people groups to an area to where it's become reprobate. And what that really means is the removal of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I'm suggesting to you we've crossed those bridges and now those bridges are burned. And what I'm praying for is the remnant to get revived because it's not till the Lord tarries, it's, it's only going to get worse. Look at verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, malice. And they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips. Isn't that interesting? Gossip gets put into murder. How, how amazing is that? You slander their character, you'll murder them. Then in verse 30, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. We're surely seeing that now, aren't we? Disobedient to parents. I love that in the sense that here we're seeing the beginnings of it. When there was rebellion in the home, no calling out for correction. And we've all seen it. The marriage is destroyed, by the way, in this country. It used to be honorable. It's not now. It used to be held in high esteem. It's gone. Am I wrong? But notice what it says in verse 31. Foolishness. Faithless, heartless, ruthless. That describes the just riding down the roads in Austin. Though they know God's righteous decree and those who practice such things deserve to die. So we're not honing in on just the sin of homosexuality. We're not honing in on just the sin of murder or adultery. It's an encompassing thing. And that's why we as believers need to have revival and be made a fresh oil come into our presence and you will be awakened to the things that you were dull to and as a result you'll change in your heart you'll change in your mind and God can still save some a remnant at that because it says though that know the righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them that's just like judges saying that good is evil and evil is good no one does right in their own, no, everyone does right in their own eyes. And we know that that is not the case. The linchpin of the country used to be family, but it's gone now. And it's so attacked and it's been replaced by, now the linchpin of the country now is self-esteem and how I can better myself. And that has become superseding, and that is the worship of self at its highest degree. The last commandment of the Ten Commandments encompass all the commandments. It is pure covetousness. And all of that is long gone. I really believe that verse 28 is the key, though. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought to be done. These same people that would say, I want Christian values and get back to where the country used to be. Listen to me. They're the same ones who will take and cheat the government to line their pockets. And I've got a Lord that told Peter and the Pharisees, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Right. So when I complain about Williamson County, Texas, I'm on shaky ground there. Right. And I need to repent and I need to say that. So as much as we want to rebel against the government, we've got a Lord who said Rome is to be respected. And that was, was and it was because of the authorities that be. Read Romans 13, if I'm wrong. If Romans 13 and Romans 14, I'm lying, I'm dying. And so this mindset that has come in is very evil because, listen to me, it has the guise of Christianness all around it. To where they could put billboards up saying about a politician, oh, in him we trust. That's the scary part. And so we need to go back to the purity of the gospel. Now, on the other side of the coin, we live in the Austin area. What 
has been famous for Austin, has been in newswise, has been one news organization, the Austin American Statesman. And now I say that in certain crowds and they all moan, right? <laughs> and you know why I think they moan? Is because the term statesman. You should be not a politician, you should be a statesman. And that's important for us to realize that that is honorable. It's doing the right thing. How is it that these politicians get into office? Local? I've got firsthand eyewitness of this. And national. And they line their pockets and they come out of office way more wealthier than they are when they went in it. Think about that with the men who went through the Revolutionary War who gave up their fortunes. They were rich and became poor for the sake of this country. Now, that's in the human area and the human arena. So in any of these aspects, what I'm telling you here is that the country is lost ultimately because not of politics, not of education, not of riches, because the church hasn't been the church. And we need to get back to that. Everything's out of control. There's chaos. They have removed the authority of the Bible. And not that we should try to do that by the vote. The vote's not the key. The Bible's got to be in here before it can ever be in the, on the bookshelves in the libraries of our schools. Right. And if it's not there, we've got a problem. So removing these things, we can only get it back until believers, the church becomes the missionary church that it should be. That's what's key here. Re removing the Bible, acknowledging the authority of the Bible, acknowledging the authority of God, removing the teaching principles of a decent society, that's what the church should be about. Removing morals. We need to have youth men and, and ladies who will minister to our children and in a, in a way in the, in the teachings of it that goes back to the catechisms, to where there was memorization. And you know why there was memorization? Because the adults had already knew those, those scriptures. They're gone now. It's gone the way of the dodo. And it needs to come back. Oh, we got to simple things there. We've got to illustrate. There's nothing wrong with illustrations. I understand that. But there is something about getting the word of God in us and a part of us. And that's what really Psalm 2 is showing in the rebellion of the people when we look at humanity's purpose. And that is so, so scary. I want you guys just to, the verse I didn't read that starts it off in Romans is the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the righteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, and the key to verse 18 is this, they suppress the truth. We need to be bold, not on your candidate of choice, not on America becoming Christian again. And I don't believe it ever really was, but we need to be bold on the truth on the word of God. And bring that into the people's. It's got to be in our heart. And it's got to be done with compassion. And it's got to be, be the removal of self-deification. And it may cost us great costs. But we're hoping that those bonds and those bands can be restored. It may bring extreme poverty to us as a church. But maybe the best thing that could happen to the church as the Lord tarries is go underground. Mm -hmm. Some of these nations that have been in the most oppressive, satanic areas have seen amazing growth of, of, of churches underground and creating issues for the government even as we speak. Not just in communist countries, but in Muslim countries. And it's not our Americanism that's going to change. Anytime we try to occupy a country, it's a disaster, isn't it? But let me tell you something, when Christ occupies a country, when Jesus is in there, it changes everything. Amen. And we've got to start by getting it here. And it's got to start right here in the church. We need to see that. And that's the rebellion of the human purpose. It really was verses 1 to 2. But if you'll see this in, 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 in the, the second part here, in heaven's purpose. Because we know the sinful man. And we know what's happened. It's complete chaos. It's deviant. It's disastrous. But in heaven's purpose, we see a power that comes into play that we're not used to seeing. Because I'm going to tell you something. It's not an image of God that 
any of us would like. And that's God mocking. God laughing at the foolishness of mankind. And that's what he does. There's three times in the Bible that God laughs. All three times. It's during man's rebellion. And it's always against the loss. Only one time is there an emotional response from God when the Christians, or when believers sin. And you know when that is? That's when we sin, we grieve God. We grieve the Holy Spirit. It moves him to hurt. So much so that the writer of Hebrews doesn't say the word grief, but it says that as a result, it's like we're crucifying Christ afresh all over again. And that you should not go to seed on that and create a whole doctrine on that. Some have. But what it means is it's hurt him so much that it's, it's memorable the scars that he had for us and what he did for us by becoming sin for us on, on Calvary. So you have heaven's purpose in direct contrast to humanity's purpose. And it's important for us to see this here. Heaven's purpose here. Verse 4. God is sitting and laughing. He's mocking. It's disdain for what his creation is now rebelling. The pot is rebelling against the potter. And it's a, it's a strong, strong hatred for both. It literally is a result of that. At the end of verse 4, God sends derision. And what that word really means is he sends madness insanity you want to know why things seem so bad right now that it's so topsy-turvy blame it on on the, on the drugs blame it on this on the sex craze culture blame it on all those problems no god has sent an evil spirit that has put us into derision and that's what's happened he's mocked us now and now it's nothing but madness that's good preaching, preacher. Amen. I'm going to amen me. If I'm not, no one's going to amen, Pastor Bobby. Amen. Y'all are an amen, and we may be here a while, okay? Because that's amen. good preaching. Amen. Bobby. Thank you. I'm just saying. It, it's, it's tough to hear these things, but at the end of Romans 1, he says amen to all this. And so we see God's hands in the blackest of pictures. Your worst trial, your worst fight, the thing that has taken you down to the depths to where you wanted to abandon your faith, you wanted to end your life, is the time when God will shine the brightest in your heart Amen. if you'll just let him. I promise you that. And so the hour is dark at this point in time for our country and for the peoples around here. But I promise you, there can be blessings that will be removing the curses. And that's what he does on, on a national worldwide wide basis. I spend a lot of time talking about the famines that are being predicted, not by some crazy preachers, but by the experts in the, in the science of the, of, the, of the growth of food. That's, they said it's going to come in one degree or another. If left unchecked, it can be catastrophic. Because of the droughts, some will blame it on global warming and all of this. There's with God either blessings on the land or cursings on the land. And it all matters to Romans 1. Are you going to retain him, the knowledge of God, in your life? I, I, atheistic children, they'll, they'll be brought to a point to where they'll recognize God if they continue in their way. Because because you got to know Psalm, Proverbs Psalms fourteen says the fool has said Proverbs fourteen says the fool has said in their heart there is no God. You'll be broken. There's no fighting this. So the blessings of the land can be restored, and the cursings, and that's for any land, not just this country. But the bond has to be made. Otherwise, he'll put a place a bond of poverty on you that you will never ex never know of. We saw it, our forefathers of a gener two generations ago knew it. And we still have people of the vestiges of that, but that's pretty much gone now. So it may be good for us to suffer is all I'm saying. I'm not anticipating, I'm not looking forward to it. And I'm not saying it's at the time that Christ has to come back, although I believe it's near. But I know this, that as a result, this comes into play. And the only answer is verse 6.
And I want you guys to see what it says in verse 6 when it says, As for me, I have set my king, this is heaven speaking now, on Zion, my holy king, Amen. my holy hill. He sets up his monarch even still. Do you realize how dark it was for Israel's history when Jesus was born? Do you realize how amazingly sinful it was? Way worse than we had it now when Jesus was crucified. Do you realize how bad it was that when those first century disciples, all the way up to the third century, they are lined with their own crosses, many of them set fire on the cross, and they would say, these Christians burning on these crosses like the roads to Rome. We're not suffering, are we? Well, Pastor Byron, my air conditioner is not working quite the way it should. Really? Stop. Stop. And, and I know we have people who have said that even here. And so I'm not, do I complain? Yes, I complain. Typically now I complain because I work outside all the time. It's too cold in these homes. And my bones hurt as a result of it. Y'all get that way? And I'm like, I'm okay. I do live in Texas. And last time I checked, it's a pretty desert place. Everything we got growing here was either implanted. Go back. This is where I really get to meddling. Go back 100 years ago and look at the pictures. You can't hardly find a blade of grass unless somebody had a well or a stream or a, 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 a spring. Y'all hearing me? Everything else I see pictures of from the late 1800s, it was dirt. All you had was different shades of brown everywhere. Why do we think it's going to be any different? The whole world may turn into that if we don't change. If we don't get back to what it is. God's promised us in our lives. He's laughing. He's mocking. But he sends this madness. Psalm 59 puts it in a great, great way. When it says here that his laughter will keep victory away from even the elect. And his mocking will bring about death and there is no hope that's 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 a can you imagine singing that song in our praise and worship psalm 59 you look it up psalm 37 says that he is laughing because he knows that retribution is coming when israel sinned in the wilderness the ground opened up and swallowed thousands at other times they sinned god gave them hemorrhoids in ways that you couldn't imagine. Other times, it was a snake, wasn't it? And it was a great picture of redemption with Satan being that picture. But for us, and in this time of the end times, it's derision. And Revelation really brings that. How colorful is Revelation on God's wrath? And that is a wrath that, let me tell you something. You think this monkeypox is by accident? You study, you read it. I can't even speak about what it is here and what has happened in the sinfulness that's going on in the world. And guess who's leading the nation in cases right now? That's right. That's right. And, 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 and yet, they just get more stubborn, they get more rebellious, and they want to burst the bands asunder. Whatever bond of commitment that was given to God at the beginning of this country. Then in contrast of that, What's amazing is verse 6, where it says at the end of the verse, and you've got to love this, my holy hill. That is the establishment of God's authority, the literally re-establishment of it. God sets up his monarchy, and he will not be mocked. He will be the one that will be doing the mocking. And we have a chance to be a part of that if we will. And i got to ask most people, and you need to be this simple. Remember what I talked about a couple of weeks ago where we've got to give them literally eye drops of truth. Just, a, just an eye dropper. Just like you would feed a little baby bird, okay? Or a small animal. Or you're going to put, what's that stuff that they put in the eyes to get the redness out? Visine, okay? You're not pouring a bucket in there, right? Just a drop. You need to ask them, who is this king? Who is Psalm 2 talking about? And let them think. Don't tell them. Let them say, who is this king? Well, it means Messiah. Who is that? Jews are still looking for him, aren't they? 
They missed that, didn't they? So we go from this to this, and this is what's important. Heaven continues now. That's their purpose is to establish the kingdom. Now God is actually speaking. And verse 7 is so important. You should note takers make note of this. It, in the, all the Psalms, it's the most quoted song in the New Testament. This verse right here, verse 7, when it says, I will tell of my decree, the Lord said to me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Boy, that don't answer the question. It was said at John's baptism. It was said at the uh, end of Jesus' ministry. It was said of Peter saying it, that he is the Christ. He says it again in 1 Peter. Paul reemphasizes re this two or three different times. It's seven direct quotes in the New Testament. At the tr Mount of Transfiguration, what did God say? A voice from heaven came down and said, Thou, this is my son. Thou art my son. In that passage, he says, hear ye him. And how true that is. Now, I believe that when David coined this, you know, what he was saying was in direct reference to the future king of Israel. Not him, but the one who would build the temple. His son, King who? Who was David's son that became king of Israel? Solomon. Solomon built the temple. Solomon's kingdom was established. No authority, no power has ever been any greater than that. No king has been any wiser than that other than Jesus Christ. But there is a kingdom to come that's going to be more powerful. As powerful as the United States thinks it is, and as powerful as the Roman dynasty of the empire of Rome, 400 some years, which is about the life of an empire, by the way, you see this, that none of them can compare all the dictators, all the despots who tried to gain land and access and power cannot compare to this kingdom. But Solomon's was close. And David knew that. So you had a near future prediction. While David's penning the words, Solomon's alive and breathing. While David's penning the words, he didn't realize the scope of his kingdom would bring about. Oh, he knew Messiah was coming, but the direct connection of that kingdom around the world was a promise that started with Abraham and goes all the way to David at the zenith of Israel's power. But the Lord knew. The Lord knew that. That's why Jehovah's son, Jesus Christ, in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, it says he is seated at the throne of power. From the resurrection, David didn't rise. Solomon didn't rise. No despot has risen. In Isaiah 52, it says this remnant will come from all the nations and worship him and learn from him his sacrifice and his resurrection, which leads right into Isaiah 53. How beautiful is that? How powerful is that? Psalm 110, verse 17. I want you guys to see this passage here. This was the passage in Psalm 2. But Psalm 110, it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my what? Fancy people would call it a hassock. Y'all got them? I got them in my house. Okay? I love them. Put my feet up. Feels good, doesn't it? I'm in control. If I had a big old burly dog like I had, I'd sit him on that dog. But guess what? That means you have control of the situation. It is your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion. Look at verse 2. Your mighty scepter rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. God's people in the womb of the morning. Isn't this beautiful? Talk about poetry. When y'all were saying this, I was jumping. My, 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 my seat. I was like, I wanted to say this because of verse 3 here. In holy garments. In, and from the womb of the morning, the dew of youth will be whose? That's us, guys. The dew of youth. You remember what it was like? Now, I'm, I'm just saying it what it is here. We're not a super young church here. I think James is our, would be our youth department. Okay? He's a teenager. Okay? You remember what it was like to be 20 years old? I know this. I had about this much brain. I got maybe this much now. 
okay? But I had a lot of vim and vigor when I was 20 years old. Y'all know what I mean? Can you imagine having that and running through God's fields every day? The womb of the morning, the dew of the morning, this youth will be yours and it'll be on the day of his power. How amazing is that? His power becomes our power. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is, and that's a priest and a king, by the way. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. Now all of a sudden it changes, doesn't it? And we see who he's talking about here. Not Solomon, but Jesus. Because Jesus will take that victory. But look at this. He doesn't stop. And he will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over their wide earth, just like we studied in Revelation. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. I love this verse. He closes out the psalm. He, our Lord, is a warrior. He is strong in battle. That's what he is. He's drinking with his eyes up, isn't he? The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. I want to refresh your memories on this. When Gideon was told by God his army's too big and he's got to chop off about 150,000 men, there were 300 of them who went down to the water and they kept their head up and they did like this because they knew a fight was coming. They were watching, weren't they? It's a great example for you and I. Don't bury your head in your pleasures of times of refreshment. Nothing wrong with being resting. Nothing wrong with being refreshed. You need that time to recharge. But some of us live in a state of entertainment and refreshment, and it needs to stop. Right. And we need to be that warrior king or that warrior soldiers of the king. And we're just like that 300 of Gideon because our Lord is doing the same thing. He stops at the brook and refreshes himself, but doesn't, doesn't put his head down. The lion and the tribe of Judah. Amen. Man, thank you. I was going to do it again. <laughs> so now you just see humanity will subjugate. The remnant will come forward. We don't know how many. But a remnant is a small, narrow port. And we've talked about this year in and year out. And we understand that. But there will be from all nations men that will come. And just like with Gideon, out of the 160-some thousand, 300 came that were God's elite, God's elect, really. And I, 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 I hasten to say this here because there's so much I can give to you. Now, I want us to go ahead and close this out. No one will be able to resist. You either submit or suffer. That's it. It's either eternal blessings on your soul and the land or eternal cursings. That's the way it's going to be. You either, I love the mud flaps on the back of a lot of 18 wheelers where you got Yosemite Sam, Sam and he's got those pistolas out. I love Yosemite Sam. <laughs> Darn rabbit. That's, that, I'm a little mixing up. Uh, what's the other hunter's name? Um, uh, Elmer Fudd. Thank you. I'm probably more of Elmer Fudd than I am. You'll see what Sam. But he says on the back of the butt flaps, turn or burn. Now we can be light of that, but we need to recognize the eternal significance of that. We cannot get past this message of what salvation means. It's not that they should get afraid of hell and trust God. They should see the glories of who God is and trust God. That's what you want. But know this, he will trample on them with his foot. He will take all enemies and make it his footstool. And so the humanity of it all will be subjugated. Now I want you guys to know this. In Psalm 110 it says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies. This is a common theme that's all throughout the Old Testament and the New. The enemies will be bowing down. This is in, in Hebrews 2. For everything is in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his what? What's it say there in verse 8? Nothing is outside of his. We think it's all chaos. We think it's all madness. He has sent those spirits. But let me tell you something. Get this. He's in control of the chaos. Amen. 
He's in control of this match. At present, we do not see everything in subjection with him. Obviously not. But as a result, we see him who is made a little lower than the angels. When you see the sin and the degradations going on, you'll all of a sudden see Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. As a result, he becomes, and I love what it says in King James in verse 10, the captain of our salvation. That's the key. He's the founder. He's the captain of our salvation. That's not a church. That's not a special club. That's not a tribe. That's not a group of people who say they're the only ones. It's all those who will come. And from all nations they will come to him. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. But all, not all of them will be saved. That's the kingdom. You've got to make it this way. And I believe it with all my heart. This is what you've got to see. It's got to be through your heart first, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And then it's got to come to your head. If it comes to your head first, you will try to overanalyze this thing. And it's not that complicated. It's simply giving yourself over to Christ and, and understanding the fullness of it. That creates this reverential fear that Oscar was talking about when he read the scriptures. There's no doubt. But that's where the head comes in. Heart comes in and we're like a trembling lamb before him. But as a result, you can tell those who are truly part of his elect because all of a sudden their hand gets busy and they start working. And that's the key here is that you take from the heart and knowledge comes to the head and you have given your life to Christ and you have subjugated to him. And as a result, your hand gets busy. And you start to serve in ways that you didn't know. And he's blessing you. Your heart is hearty. Your head is on straight. And your hand is purposeful. And as a result, you get the blessings from the ancient warrior of God, Jesus Christ. Now, I end it with this. This beautiful picture. John chapter 15, he says, I don't call you slaves. He says to them, and this is what it's about, I call you friends. Amen. I give my life, not for slaves, I give my life for friends. So you're immediately put into another category. Even though we are slaves to Christ, we're servants to Christ, he moves you, your hand still serves. I'm not saying you don't still serve. Too much of this friendship thing goes in that everybody's just okay and that's wrong. It's not a universal salvation. But he moves you to a friendship. Now, let me tell you why that's important. Abraham was a friend of God. Y'all remember that passage? Yeah. He says that in Genesis 12. Friend of God. Now, we take that to mean, I'm a friend of James. I'm a friend with Susan. I got a connection. Well, I got my family, too. And that's more important than a friend. But I can tell you there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Isn't that what it says in Proverbs? But get this. That's even not the full definition. Jesus is saying in John chapter 15 the word friends. The friend of God in Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham. In the Greek Septuagint. The, the, the translation that Jesus was using was. The, it's the Hebrew Bible but it was translated in Greek. And because Greek was the common language. In, at that time, some Aramaic, but they were not speaking. Most of them did not speak Hebrew. So they speak in Greek. The Greek translation for friend of God is prince. It's nobility. It becomes something much more. Jacob was a trickster and a surplanner. But he became Israel, a prince of God. Amen. Right before you, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you're here today, I want you to realize that your friendship, your friend with God means your prince and princesses with him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our Father, we're thankful for the truths of the word of God. Lord, it was the Greek philosophers who bore that truth out at the time of Christ and the disciples realized it. We miss it in our English. And I've missed that for years. Until coming across it. And studying the, the original language. Phileto. Phileo. Meant to them. Nobility. 
and it meant that you were a prince of the king. God, may we start acting like that. May we realize that we are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood that has been called into your marvelous light. And may we live like it each and every day. May we be the people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.